Okay, so last time we had talked about an implementation of a class called the Memoizer. And the Memoizer, if you recall, basically would map, uh, atomically map a key to a value, and that was used to cache the results that needed to be looked up if they were going to be expensive to compute. And the example we used there was prime number checking, checking for primality of a number. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about a memoizing cache that's implemented using the Java scheduled executor service in order to be able to time out the uh, key value mappings if they're not used for a while. So the, the downside with the original memoizers, it would just keep growing and growing and growing. And if you didn't look up things after a while, it would still just stick around and make things slow. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use the scheduled executor to have a timeout that will time out the key value bindings if they're not used after so much time, let's say half a second or a minute or whatever you want the, the uh, delta to be. So we're also going to use something else that's pretty cool too. Last time I showed you how to use the timed or to use a memoizer, non-timed memoizer using Java future task. Now we're going to use a cool method called compute if absent, which comes with concurrent hash map. So we're going to replace the implementation here to use the concurrent hash map. And we're going to use the compute if absent method to get rid of all the future task stuff. And we're also going to show off a whole bunch of interesting things about how to do timeout handling properly. Now, this particular implementation, the first version we're going to look at, is going to work as follows. So we're going to give a number, like let's say, you know, half a second or whatever. And whenever you put a key into the map, if the key is not in the map, we'll have a function that computes the value for the key. And that'll all work in a way we'll talk about in a second. But then it's also going to, on a per key value pairing basis, it's going to go ahead and register or schedule a special runnable that'll wake up, say, half a second later, if half a second is the, the timeout period. And it'll go ahead and see whether or not that key value binding has been accessed in that elapsed time. If it has been accessed in elapsed time, it'll reschedule it for another, say, half second. And so what will happen is as long as things are being used, they'll stay in the map. But if they're not used after the period, after, say, a half second, then they're going to be removed from the map. So every key value binding is going to have a timeout that's going to check for it periodically, you know, every half second or whatever and see whether it's been used, and it'll get rid of stuff if it hasn't been used in that, in that amount of time. So that's the big picture view of what we're trying to do here. So there's a bunch of uh, internal state. As you can imagine, we have a concurrent hash map that maps keys to ref counted values. I'll explain what a ref counted value is in a second. That's the thing that we use to keep track of whether or not the key has been accessed since the last timeout period. We're going to have our little function that's used to compute the value based on a key. We did that before. You can pass it in as a parameter to do things like primality checking or whatnot. We have a timeout that's used to keep track of how long we're going to retain a value in the cache. You can set that, as you'll see, in the constructor. We have our scheduled executor service. This is the executor service implementation that's going to be used to time things out after a certain amount of time elapses. We're going to have a super cool little clever constant called ref counted value, or it's called m non accessed value of type ref counted value. And the key thing here is that the ref count will be one. So as it'll turn out in a second, <clears throat> when we come back every so often to check to see whether or not our key has been accessed, if the ref count is still one, that means it hasn't been accessed. So that makes it ready for purging. We're going to get rid of it in that case. Here's ref counted value. This is a little helper class that has two things in it. One is an atomic long, which is the ref count. And so we're going to use this in order to see whether or not this guy's been changed during the period of the elapsed time. And then we're also going to keep track of the value that happens to be whatever is really stored in the map. The constructor goes ahead and stashes the value and creates the atomic long. We have an equals method. This is used by the hash map to determine whether the, key, the keys equal each other. And this is just the classic way you implement equals. You check to see whether or not you're the right class. And then you go ahead and you check the 
ref counts to see if they have the right value. All right, and here's the get method. The get method on this class is going to increment the count by one, the reference count by one, and return the current value. So in other words, every time somebody goes and reads the value associated with a key, the ref count gets bumped up by one. So what that basically is doing is it's keeping track of the last time it was accessed. Not the time, but the fact that it was accessed. So every time someone goes to check the value in the map, this ref count will go up by one. And you'll see how that gets used in a second. The last method in here is called schedule. And what this does is it uses the scheduled executor service to schedule a runnable. The runnable is called remove if stale. We'll look at that in a second. And it schedules this runnable, and it uses the runnable to say, if nothing's changed with this particular key value binding after that elapsed time, then purge the item, because it's now stale. Otherwise, keep it around. So we're going to take a look at this. It's very, very cool. And I'll explain how it works, and I'll also talk about why it's a runnable as opposed to a lambda expression. It's very subtle, but it's important. OK, so what we're going to do here, we're going to make this runnable called remove if stale. And just skipping ahead a little bit, once we have that runnable, we're going to go ahead and schedule it. We're going to schedule remove if stale. And we're going to say, I want you to run in this amount of time in the future. So again, let's just assume that it's you know, half a second or a second or a minute. You know, whatever it is, you can set what that timeout is going to be. So we're saying, call me back in a half second. And when it says call me back, it's going to call remove if stale. So here's what remove if stale does. Remove if stale is a runnable, so it has a run hook method. And that run hook method is going to be called. Now, what's particularly interesting about this implementation is that it's designed to be essentially um, wait free. So we're, we're never going to block on anything. And so it's all, and it's also going to try as much as possible to use all the clever locking mechanisms that are available in Java concurrent hash map and some other helper classes we use. But the idea here is we never want to lock the whole map. We're going to do minimal amount of locking to make sure that things don't get corrupted. So the first thing we do is we come along and we get the current reference count. So remember, every value keeps track of its reference count. Start, it starts out with a value of 1 when it's first accessed. So we're going to check to see what the current ref count is. And we're going to use this later. We're then going to come down here, and we're going to use the atomic remove operation on the concurrent hash map. mcache is the concurrent hash map instance. We're going to say, please remove this key, and, and its value, of course, if the, the value in the map is m non-accessed value. And the key thing to remember about m non-accessed value is it's got a ref count of 1. So what this is saying is, please get this item out of the map if it hasn't been accessed during the last timeout period. Because if it hasn't been accessed, it's got a count of 1. Its ref count is 1. And this will also have a ref count of 1. So if that was the case, if it hadn't been accessed, if we removed it, we logged the fact that we got it out of the cache because it hadn't been accessed. However, if it had been accessed, its count will be higher than 1. So in that case, we just do a little sanity checking to make sure that everything does what we want. And now we're going to do some really cool magic. And this is super, super cool. Really obscure, but very cool features that are going to be shown off here. So remember, this is the case where the item was accessed. And now what we want to do is we want to set it up again so that in the timeout, when the next timeout period elapses, we're going to call ourselves back again to see if it was accessed. Right? So it's kind of like a bucket brigade or like passing a baton to yourself or something like that. So we scheduled this thing as a one-shot timer. Every time it goes off, it comes back in, sees whether or not the item should be removed. If so, it removes it. If not, it's going to do some magic here with the ref count, which I'll talk about in a second. And then it's going to go ahead and schedule this item to get run again in the future. So it'll just every, as long as the item is accessed, it continues to exist. It continues to stick around in the cache. If it's not accessed, it's taken out. So here's the interesting part. So we've come in here, and we know what the old ref count was, because that's what we 
checked up here. We, we grab the old ref count. But remember that we never actually lock the map. So it's quite possible that something else in a different thread could have triggered this and accessed the item. So what we're going to do here is we're going to check whether or not the, uh, the current count of M ref count has changed since when we checked it up there and here. Even though that's only a few lines of code in between, it could have changed because concurrency always does things at the worst possible time. So there's a cool method called get and update that's defined on M ref count. And this is a really interesting atomic uh, operation. And what it does is it does the following. It says, take the current count. So current count is what the current count is here. And if the current count is greater than the old count, right? In other words, if something did in fact change from between here, where we check the old count, and here, if something changed, we're going to make that be the, um, the, the current count is, is what the current count is. In other words, we're just going to keep it the way it is. Otherwise, we're going to set it back to 1. So remember, 1 is an indication that um, it's been reset. So we'll check again later to see if anything has changed. So this, what's interesting about this particular code is that this lambda expression that we're passing in here, current count greater than old count, question mark, current count, or 1, that's going to get run inside the atomic long or integer or whatever this thing is inside of this method with the lock held. So this will be an atomic operation. We're atomically updating the value of this. So it's really interesting. But we're not locking, we're not locking the whole map. The whole map never locks. We're just locking this one particular field in as, that stores the value for that key. So this will then get set to the right value, either the current count or back to 1. And then we schedule ourselves to get run in the future. All right, so that's basically the ref count value class. Now let's come down and look at the uh, constructor. Constructor takes the function, which is going to be used to compute the value associated with the key. It takes the timeout in milliseconds. For this particular implementation, everybody's timed out with the same amount of time. You could imagine doing it differently, where each time you apply something, you could give it its own timeout. We don't do it that way here, but you could do that. We stash the function. We create ourselves the scheduled thread pool executor, which has a single thread. So it's got one thread that'll run in the background. We stash the timeout in milliseconds. And then we have to do some bookkeeping to make sure that things shut down properly. What we do is we go ahead and take our scheduled executor service, and we convert it to its actual implementation, which is a scheduled thread pool executor, because we created one like that up here. And then we go ahead and we set the policies to what we want. We want to remove the runnables on cancellation, and we want to disable periodic and delayed tasks at shutdown. If you don't set these things, then you get the wrong default behavior, which does strange stuff, because you keep calling timeouts even after you shut things down, which is absolutely not what we want. OK, here then is the apply method. This is the method that's kind of the heavy lifter. This is going to basically apply the key and return the value. So that's, that's really what the memoizer is doing. Remember, the whole point of the memoizer is to try to find you the results. And if the first time there's no value associated with the key, we're going to have to go ahead and create something and stick it into the map. And here's where things get really fun. So if you remember last time we had done, the, uh, we'd done this using the future task, and it was pretty complicated. Well, because it's pretty complicated and it's such a common idiom, they bake that into Java in the form of something called compute if absent, which is an atomic check then act method. And the way this works is you go look up the key in the map, and if the key has a value, you just return the value. It's all thread safe, of course. If the key does not yet have a value, then this lambda expression is going to be run in order to give the key a value. And any other threads that are trying to do the same association of key with value will block until that computation is finished. So it works like future tasks, but you don't have to implement it yourself. 
So here's what happens. This code in here between the open curly brace and the closed curly brace all runs atomically. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and make ourselves a new ref counted value that will have the value of applying the function to the key. So that's like, you know, check if something's a prime number or whatever. That's whatever generic thing the function was. And it's got an initial count of zero, initial ref count of zero. So we have a new ref counted value. And then what we're going to do is if we haven't been shut down and the timeout in milliseconds is greater than zero, we're going to schedule, we're going to call that schedule method we just looked at for this key. So this is going to say, you know, call me back in m timeout in milliseconds time and see if I've been accessed or not. Then once this piece of code runs once, now we have a value, which is a ref counted value, in the concurrent hash map. And the last thing we do is we say rc value dot get, and that returns the value, and it also increment the ref count. So it'll start out with a ref count of one the first time through. So that's what apply does. This is this code in the computer absent. This lambda is only called one time, no matter how many threads all call it at the same time if there's no key value mapping yet. And then here's the shutdown operation. It just shuts down the executor service, scheduled executor service, and clears out the entries in the map. OK, so that's the implementation. Now, the key thing to note is this, this code works. It's really cool. If you run the example program that goes along with it, it does what it's supposed to do. There's one downside, however. And the downside is we scheduled a runnable for every single key. So if I was to put you know, tens of thousands of entries in this map, my scheduled executor service would have a very large number of runnables it has to keep track of. It would have this giant list or data structure of all the, the timers, that the runnables, in order to time out. And that gets excessive. So that's the downside. This approach works. It gives you a great degree of granularity on the timeouts. We don't use that in this case, but it gives you granularity to control each timeout. But it's also probably overkill in terms of space utilization. OK, so with that in mind, let's move on to the Next implementation. So now that we've looked at the implementation that does timed memoization using the scheduled executor service with a runnable per key value binding, we're going to look at a new implementation that optimizes things tremendously with respect to space utilization. And it'll actually probably run better, although you, you wouldn't get as fine-grained control over when you dispatch stuff. And we'll see why in a second. All right, so here, some things are the same. We've got our function that's going to be used to produce a value based on the key, which could be our prime number checker or something else. Once again, we keep track of the amount of time to remain to retain a value in the cache for each key. We have a ref counted value, which is very similar to what we had before. It has a ref count, has a value, it has a constructor that sets those things. It's got an equality method that's used by the concurrent hash map to check whether the two keys are equal. It's got a get method that gets and increments the ref count and returns the value. All that's the same as we did before. The main difference is it doesn't have a schedule method in it. And you'll see why in a second, because we're doing scheduling in a different way. We also have our non, uh, m non-access value constant, which is set to 1. So we can use that to quickly check to see if anything's changed during the allotted time of the dispatching. We have our concurrent hash map. That's all the same as before, too. The hash map maps keys to ref counted values. But then we have a few extra things. Here's something we've got. We've got something that's called the uh, threshold crosser, which is this really funky class I'll show you in a second that's used to keep track of when something crosses a threshold, say from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. We're going to have a way to get a hook when a threshold is crossed. And you'll see why we need that in a second. We also keep track of a, uh, something called a scheduled future. And this is used so we can cancel something that's going to run in the future using the scheduled executor service. Unlike the previous implementation of time memoizer, where there was a runnable for every key value mapping, this implementation has one and only one runnable. And it's called purge entries. And here's what it's going to do. Purge entries, when it's called back, is going to, and so the way this is going to work is, we're only going to have one runnable 
for all of the timers, for, for all the key value mappings that we want to keep track of. We have one timer and only one timer. And what it's going to do is whenever it's called every timeout milliseconds, it's going to iterate through the entire set of entries in the concurrent hash map. And it's going to check each one to see whether it's changed since the last timeout elapsed. So this is going to happen one time. So rather than having a separate runnable for each entry that runs in the scheduled executor service, we're going to have one timer, one runnable, which when called back will handle everything. So of course the space utilization will go way down because we're going to have one as opposed to n, where n could have been rather huge. So even if we have 10,000 entries in the cache, we're only going to have one thing that does this. Of course, there's a trade-off. The trade-off is sort of space for precision. So because this thing's got to sweep through all the entries, um, the timeout granularity may not be quite as precise. Although, honestly, in practice, it's probably just as precise because it's got a lot less overhead. So we're going to sweep through all the entries. For every entry, we're going to store the key and the, and the value, which is the ref counted value. We're going to take a look and see what the current ref count value is for the value, much like we did before. We're then going to try to remove the key if it's not been changed in the last timeout period. And now, if we did remove something, if we're able to remove something from the cache, we're going to check to see whether or not there are any entries left in the cache. And we're going to use the threshold counter in order to do this. The threshold counter keeps track of the number of entries in the cache. And if the decrementing was to drive the count to zero, so if the count goes to zero, so decrement and call at n, so n is zero, if we decrement this thing and it reaches zero, then what we're going to do is we're going to cancel this timer from running anymore. Because what it says is, you know, there's no point in having a timer go off every n milliseconds if there's nothing in the map, right? That would be kind of pointless. Nothing could possibly get timed out because there's nothing to time out. So if it's the case that we no longer have any entries, then we cancel the timer. And the way we do that is we call cancel on the scheduled future. You'll see where scheduled future gets set in a second. OK. If the entry has been accessed within the time frame, then what we're going to do is our same trick we did before, where we're going to update its ref count to either be one or current count if it was to change. All right, so that's what the purge entries runnable does. And there's only one of them, and it only gets scheduled one time. We'll see how it gets scheduled in a second. We have a scheduled executor service, which is used to do all the timeout management. Here's our constructor. We store the function. We store the timeout period. We make ourselves a scheduled executor service. We set the policies, and so on and so forth. OK, now it, it gets kind of cool again. Here's apply. So remember, apply is the main entry point into this whole abstraction. We pass in a key. What we want to do is get back the value associated with that key. Once again, we use compute if absent. If the key is already there, we're going to get back the value. We're done. If the key is not yet there, then this lambda expression will be run once and only once, no matter how many other keys are trying to be uh, accessed with the same value. And what this does, this is sort of the, the inverse of the decrement and call it n method. What this does is if the cache count went from 0 to 1, so now we have this is the first item we're putting into the cache. Before it was empty, now there's one element in there. What we're going to do then is we're going to go ahead and schedule m purge entries, which is that runnable we just looked at. And we're going to say, I want you to run the first time in m timeout in millisecond time. And then I want you to periodically keep running over and over and over again until I tell you to stop. And you get told to stop, of course, when the count goes from 1 to 0 later. And that would work by canceling the scheduled future. So notice how M scheduled executor service schedule at fixed rate is going to schedule this runnable to run periodically at this rate. And it returns a future which, as we saw just a minute ago, 
can be canceled here when we remove the last entry in the cache. So this is sort of a hook that gets called back. Uh, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a, a hook on the, uh, the concurrent hash map to run when you put the first entry into the cache. So we have to have an external counter that keeps track of that. So that's what uh, Threshold Crosser does. And I'll show you Threshold Crosser in just a second. So what's happening here is the first time we compute uh, a value for a key, we also check to see if this is the very first entry added to the concurrent hash map at all. And if it is, we schedule a timer to run at a fixed rate, so it'll keep getting called back over and over again. But there's only one runnable that's registered, so we don't have to worry about it um, taking up lots, chewing up lots of space. We then go ahead and add the new ref counted value, giving it the value from applying the function with an initial count of zero. And then rcValue.get will return the value and increment its ref count the first time to give it a value of one. And shutdown does the same thing as before. It zeroes everything out, closes it down. So the last thing I'll show you real quick is Threshold Crosser, which is just a fun little class. I'm still kind of thinking about better ways to implement this, but this is my first, first shot at it. So Threshold Counter keeps a count, and it's given some initial value when you, when you initialize the class, value of zero, for example. And here is increment and call at n and decrement and call at n, which, is, which are admittedly very verbose method names, probably have something a little bit more clean, but it explains what it's doing. So you give it an n, and you give it an action. And in the critical section, if you increment the count by 1, and it equals n, then you run the action. Likewise, decrement and call it n, if you decrement the count by 1 with the intrinsic lock held, and it equals the given n, then it goes ahead and runs the action. So I use this as a way to be able to know when to trigger the either registration of the runnable with the scheduled executor service, which will then keep running periodically, until we remove the last item, and then I tell it to shut down. So the run method here just calls back to cancel that particular runnable. OK. So once again, if you uh, run the program that this is associated with, this is called, uh, this one's called Prime Executor Completion Service, and the other one was called Prime Scheduled Executor Service. They'll demonstrate how to use these different variants of Scheduled Executor Service, which is really the whole point of all this, um, in order to be able to demonstrate how to um, manage timers in the context of our Memoizer, which was a cool class. So hopefully that kind of brings it all full circle in terms of uh, the synchronization mechanisms. I should probably also note that these are really interesting examples of how to use a smorgasbord of cool Java concurrency mechanisms and synchronizers and con collect, uh, concurrent containers, concurrent collections, and uh, Java 8 features. Because it's combining them all together. And you'll notice that really nowhere do we do we lock an entire data structure? I guess the, the closest thing to, to locking an entire data structure using a traditional lock is the little synchronize this call here, which basically synchronizes long enough to uh, check and run. Uh, and this could probably, if you're really obsessed with having like lock-free uh, access, th this could probably be replaced with some kind of compare and, and swap operation, like the spin lock you guys implemented for one of the earlier assignments. So if you really don't want to have any locking and weight locking, you could even do that. Because this critical section here is really fast. It shouldn't take very long to run. OK, so that's basically the full solution for the scheduled executor service. So now you know yet another thing about how all that stuff works.